Chapter Twenty Four of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four A Terrible Bed. It was nearly noon, and having failed so completely in his efforts to regain the pass, Fred determined to devote a little time to procuring food. He was certain that he would soon require it and might postpone his hunt too long. Although now and then he suffered somewhat from want of water, yet it was not for any length of time. There was an abundance of streams and rivulets, and he frequently stumbled upon them when he had no expectation of doing so. Quaffing his fill from one of these, he rested a few minutes, for he had been laboring unceasingly for hours. "'What a pity a fellow, when he got caught in such a fix as this, wasn't like a camel, so that he might store away enough water to last him a week. And then if he could do the same with what he ate, he needn't feel scared when he got lost like me.' His gun, of course, was as useless to him as a stick, and although in his long tramping it became onerous and oppressive, he had no thought of abandoning it. "'I don't see as there is any chance of killing any animals to eat, and if I did I haven't got any matches to start a fire to cook them, so I must get what I want some other way.' He had noticed in his wanderings here and there a species of scarlet berry about the size of the common cherry, but he refrained from eating any, fearing that they were poisonous. He now ventured to taste two or three, and found them by no means unpleasant to the palate, but fearful of the consequence he swallowed but a little, waiting to see the result before going into the eating line any more extensively. A half hour having passed without any internal disturbance, he fell to and ate fully a pint. There was not much nourishment in them but they seemed to serve his purpose very well, and when he resumed his wandering he felt somewhat like a giant refreshed with new wine. As it seemed useless to lay out any definite line to follow, Fred made no attempt to do so, believing he was as likely to reach the ravine by aimless traveling as by acting upon any theory of his own as to the location of the place he desired to reach. This he continued to do until the afternoon was about half spent. He was still plodding along, with some hope of success, when he became aware of a sickness stealing over him. The thought of the berries, and the fear that he had been poisoned, gave him such a shock that the slight nausea was greatly intensified, and he reclined upon the ground in the hope that it would soon pass over. Instead of doing so, he grew worse and he stretched out upon the ground, firmly persuaded that his last hour had come. He was deathly pale, and had he espied a cougar peering over the corner of the rock, he wouldn't have paid him the least attention. No, not if there had been a dozen of them. What alarmed Fred as much as anything was some of the accompaniments of his trouble. As he laid his head upon the ground, it seemed to him that he could catch the faint sound of falling water just as if there was a little cascade a mile away, and the gentle wind brought him the soft musical cadence. Then, too, when he flung himself upon the ground it gave forth a hollow sound such as he had never heard before. Several times he banged his heel against the earth, and the same peculiarity was noticed. All this the poor fellow took as one of the accompaniments of the poisoning, and as additional proof that he was beyond hope. He rolled upon the ground in misery, and wondered whether he would have his mind about him when the last dreadful moment should come. But after a half hour or more had passed, and he was still himself, he began to feel a renewal of hope. "'It may be that I ate too many of them,' he reflected, as he found himself able to sit up, "'and there's nothing poisonous about them after all.' If that's so, I've got a good meal anyway, and nowhere to get another. It was nearly dark, and as he was still weak, he concluded to spend the night where he was. A rod or so away was a dense clump of bushes which seemed to offer an inviting shelter, and he gained his feet with the intention of walking to them. He had taken no more than a couple of steps, however, when such a dizziness overcame him that he sank at once to the ground and stretched out for relief. It was a case of poisoning beyond question, 
but not of a dangerous nature, and Fred had about time to lie flat when he experienced a grateful relief. "'I guess I'll stay here a while,' he muttered, recalling his experience. "'I can crawl in among the bushes in the night if I find it getting cold or any rainfalls.' Darkness had scarcely descended when the lad sank into a quiet, dreamless slumber. His rest of the night previous had not been of a refreshing character, and his traveling during the day had been very exhaustive, so that his wearied system was greatly in need of rest. Fred was really in the most delightful climate in the world. New Mexico is so far south that the heat in many portions at certain seasons of the year assumes a tropical fervor. On some of the arid plains the sun's rays have an intensity like that of the Sahara, but numerous ranges of mountains traverse the territory north and south with spurs in all directions, and the elevation of many of these give a temperature as cool and pleasant as can be desired. As the lad stretched out upon the ground, he was without a blanket or any covering except his ordinary clothes, and he needed nothing more. The surrounding rocks shut out all wind, and the air was not warm enough to cause perspiration. The fact was, he had struck that golden mean which leaves nothing to be desired as regards the atmosphere. The sky remained clear, and as the moon climbed higher and higher in the sky, it was only at intervals that a fleecy cloud floated before it, causing fantastic shadows to glide over the ground, and making strange phantom-like formations among the mountain peaks and along the chasms, gorges, ravines, and precipices. Had the sleeping lad awoke and risen to his feet, he would have seen nothing of wolf, catamount, or Indian, nor would the straining vision have caught the glimmer of any solitary campfire. He was alone in the great solitude, with no eye but the all-seeing one to watch over him. It was a curious fact connected with the boy's wanderings, that more than once he was within a stone's throw of the pass for which he was so anxiously searching, and yet he never suspected it, owing to his unfamiliarity with the territory. As is nearly always the case with an inexperienced hunter, he showed a continual tendency to travel in a circle, the nature of the ground only preventing him from doing so. Fred slept, without disturbance, until after midnight. An hour or so previous to his waking, when the moon was in the best position to lighten up the earth below, the figure of a man appeared upon an eminence a hundred yards or more away, and stood motionless for several minutes as though he were engaged in reverie. Could one have looked more closely, he would have seen that the stranger's action and manner showed that he was hunting for something. He turned slowly around several times, scanning the ravines, gorges, peaks, and declivities as best he could, but he did not expect to gain much without the daylight to assist him, and the result of the attempt was anything but satisfactory. Muttering some impatient exclamation, he turned about, and walked slowly away, taking a direction almost opposite of that which led toward the sleeping boy. He moved with caution, like one accustomed to the wilderness, and was soon lost to view in the gloom. When Fred Munson awoke, it was with the impression upon him that he was near some waterfall. He raised his head, but could detect nothing. But when he placed his ear to the ground, he caught it once again. "'I have it,' he said to himself. There is a waterfall somewhere about here under the ground. That's what makes it sound so hollow when I stamp on it. He was greatly relieved to find that no results of his afternoon's nausea remained by him. He had recovered entirely, and when he rather doubtingly assumed the sitting position and felt that his head and stomach remained clear, he was considerably elated in spirits. That shows that I can get a meal at any time if I want it bad enough to take a few hours' sickness in pay. Maybe I can find something else to eat which won't be so hard on me. It must be very near morning, for I have slept a great while. The hour, however, was earlier than he supposed, and he found after sitting a while that his old drowsiness was returning. Before giving way to it, he recalled the clump of bushes which was so near that it was easily seen from where he sat. 
I forgot that I meant to make my bed there. With which he rose and moved toward it, not feeling altogether certain of the wisdom of what he was doing. That looks very much like the place where the cougar was waiting for me, but I didn't think there were enough in this country to furnish one for every bush. He reconnoitred it for several minutes, but finally ventured upon a closer acquaintance. There certainly was no wild animal there, and he stooped down and began crawling toward the center. He was near the middle when he was alarmed at finding the ground giving way beneath him. It was sinking rapidly downward, and he clutched desperately at the bushes to save himself, but those that he grasped yielded and went too. In his terror and despair he cried out and fought like a madman to save himself, but there was nothing firm or substantial upon which he could lay hold, and he was helpless to check his descent. Down, down, down he went in the pulseless darkness, lower and lower, until he found himself going through the dizzying air. To where? End of chapter 24 Read by Thomas Rose Chapter 25 of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 Within the Earth. It was like a terrible dream, and for an instant or more, during which Fred Munson was descending through the gloom and darkness, he believed it was such indeed. But he was quickly recalled from his error by his arrival at the end of his journey. The truth was that the boy, in crawling beneath the clump of bushes for shelter, would have crawled head first into the mouth of the cave, but for the fact that the ground immediately surrounding the opening gave way beneath his weight before he reached it. His fall was not very far, and when he struck the ground it was so soft and yielding that he was scarcely conscious of a jar. But the nervous shock was so great that for a few minutes he believed that he was fatally injured. When he was able to recall his scattered senses, he looked around him in the hope of gaining some idea of where he was, but he quickly saw that he was in a place where his eyes were of no service. The darkness was as impenetrable as that which plagued Pharaoh and his Egyptians. Only when he looked upward was the blackness of darkness relieved. Enough straggling rays worked their way through the bushes to give the opening a dim, misty appearance such as is sometimes observed when that orb is rising in a cloud of fog and vapor, but in every other direction he might as well have been blind for all the good his eyes did him. One of the first things that struck the lad was the sound of the waterfall which he had heard so distinctly when stretched upon the earth. It was somewhere near him so close even that he fancied he could feel the dampness from it, but the soft, rippling character showed that it did not amount to much. It was a mere cascade, the water of which entered and passed out of the cavern by some means which the boy could only surmise. How extensive was this cave? Had it any outlet other than that by which Fred had entered? Was the flow even or irregular? Were there pitfalls and abysses about him, making it too perilous to attempt to grope about in the gloom? Having entered, how was he to make his way out again? Such questions as these presented themselves to the boy as he stood alone in a world of night and endeavored to consider the situation calmly. Stooping down, he felt of the soil. It was of a cold, sandy nature, and so yielding that when he struck it, he went below his ankles. He stood for some time debating whether he should remain where he was until the coming of day in the hope of gaining additional light, or whether he should venture upon a little cautious exploration. He finally decided upon the latter. When the elephant goes on a bridge, he feels of it with his trunk to see whether it is strong enough to bear him, and I'll use my gun to do the same thing. This was no more than a simple precaution, and doubtless saved his life. Grasping the stock firmly, he reached the muzzle forward and punched the ground pretty thoroughly before venturing upon it, 
making sure that it was capable of bearing him safely forward into the darkness beyond. Generally speaking, the ground of the cavern was tolerably even. There were little irregularities here and there, but none of them were of a nature to interfere with walking, provided one could have enough light to see where he was going. "'If I only had a lantern, I could get round this neighborhood a good deal faster than this,' he said. "'It wouldn't be anything more than fun to explore this cave, which may be as big as the mammoth one of Kentucky.' Up to this time Fred had been moving almost directly away from the cascade which he had noticed. The misty light over his head served somewhat as a guide, and he determined not to wander away from that which would prevent his getting lost in the bowels of the earth. The boy was quite confident that there was some easy way of getting out of the cave, for if there was none except by the opening above, then he was in a Bastille most surely. It was undoubtedly the cascade which added to this conviction, for it seemed to him more than likely that if the water entered and left the cave, the volume which it did so must be of a varying quantity, so that at certain seasons it was capable of carrying a boy with it. This, of course, was extremely problematical, but it was hopeful enough to prevent anything like despair taking possession of the lad as he felt his way around the cavern. Every stream finds its way to the daylight after a time, and so must this, and why can't it take a fellow along with it? That's what I should like to know. He paused with a gasp of amazement, for at that moment the gun went out of his hand as suddenly as if someone in waiting had grasped the muzzle and jerked it away. But there was no human agency in the matter. While punching the surface, he had approached a vast abyss, and the thrust over the edge was so unexpected that the impulse carried it out of his hand. As the boy stood amazed and frightened, he heard the weapon going downward, heaven could only tell where. First it struck one side, and then another, the sound growing fainter and fainter until at last the strained and listening ear failed to hear it at all. The depth of the opening was therefore enormous, and Fred shuddered to think how nearly he had approached, and by what a hair's breadth he had escaped a terrible death. At this juncture the boy suddenly recalled that he had some friction matches in his possession. He was not in the habit of carrying them, but several days before he had carefully wrapped up a half-dozen with the intention of kindling a fire in the wood near New Boston. From that time until the present he had failed to remember the circumstance, although he had so frequently felt the need of a light. He found a half-dozen securely wrapped about with a piece of newspaper, and he carefully struck one. The moment the point flickered into a flame he held it forward and looked downward. There was the chasm, which came so nigh swallowing him in the shape of a seam or rent some three or four feet in width. It had the appearance of having been caused by some convulsion of nature, and it extended at right angles to the course he was pursuing beyond the limit of his vision. If necessary, it could be leaped over, but the explorer deemed it unwise to do so just then. Now that he had the means at command, Fred decided to look after the cascade, the sound of which was a guide. His gun was irrevocably gone, and his progress, therefore, became the more tedious. Disliking to creep, he adopted the plan of advancing one step, and then groping around a while with the other foot before trusting his weight upon it. This consumed considerable time, but it was the only safe course after what had taken place, and he kept it up until the musical murmur of the waterfall showed that he had approached about as close as possible. He then struck another match and held it over his head. It told the whole story. A stream, not more than three or four feet in width, issued from the darkness and, flowing some distance, went over a ledge of rock. After falling three or four yards upon some black and jagged rocks, it gathered itself together and resumed its journey into and through the gloom. The tiny flame was unequal to the task of showing where the water entered and left the cave, and as the boy was straining his eyesight in the hope of discovering something more, the blaze scorched his fingers and he snapped it out. "'That leaves only 
poor, he mused as he felt of the lucifers, and I haven't got enough to spare. I can't gain much by using them that way, and so I guess I'll hold on to these and see whether the daylight is going to help me. He picked his way carefully along until he was nearly beneath the opening which had admitted him where he sat down upon the dry, sandy ground to await the light of the sun. I don't suppose it'll help much, for the bushes up there will keep out pretty much of the sunlight that might have come through, but I guess I'll have plenty of time to wait, and that's what I'll do. He fell into a sort of doze, lulled by the music of the cascade, which lasted until the night was over. As soon as he awoke, he looked upward to see how matters stood. The additional light showed that the day had come, but it produced no perceptible effect upon the interior of the cave. All was as dark, that is, upon the bottom, as ever. It was only in the upper portion that there was a faint lighting up. Fred could see the jagged edges of the opening, with some of the bushes bent over and seemingly ready to drop down with the dirt and gravel clinging to their roots. The opening was irregular and some four or five feet in extent, and as near as he could estimate it was some thirty feet above his head. If I happened to come down on a rock I might have got hurt, but things down here were fixed to catch me and it begins to look as though they were fixed to hold me, too. His situation was certainly very serious. He had no gun or weapons of any kind other than a common jackknife, and it looked very much as if there was no way for him to get out of the cave again without outside assistance, of which the prospect was exceedingly remote. He was hungry, and without the means of obtaining food. The berries which had acted so queerly with him the day before were beyond his reach. Vegetation needs the sunlight, as do all of us, and it is useless to expect anything edible below. Unless it's fish, thought Fred aloud. I've heard that they find them in the mammoth cave without eyes, and there may be some of the same kind here. But then I'm just the same as a boy without eyes, and how am I going to find them? The more he reflected upon his situation, the more disheartened did he become. He had been given many remarkable deliverances in the past few days, and although his faith was strong that Providence would bring him out of this last predicament, his heart misgave him as he considered it in all its bearings. The best thing I can do is to try and gather some wood together and start a fire. If there is enough fuel, I may kindle a lantern that will show me something in the way of a new door. Hello, what's the matter? His attention was attracted by the rattling of gravel and dirt at his side, and looking up he saw that something was struggling in the opening above, having been caught apparently in precisely the same manner as he had been. His first supposition was that it was a wild animal, but at the next moment he observed that it was a person, most probably an Apache warrior, and by the time Fred had learned that much, down came his visitor. End of Chapter 25. Read by Thomas Rose. Chapter 26. Of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 26. A Welcome Visitor. Lonely as Fred Munson felt in that dismal cavern, he preferred the solitude to the companionship of an Apache Indian, and fearful of discovery he crouched down to wait until he should move away. His involuntary visitor dropped within a few feet of where he was hiding, and Fred tried to hold his breath for fear he might be detected, but the fellow quietly rose and gave expression to his sentiments. "'Begorra, if I haven't fell through into the cellar as me grandmother did when she danced down the whole party and landed on the bottom and kept up the jig without a break, keeping time with the one-eyed fiddler above. Fred could scarcely believe the evidence of his own senses. That was the voice of his old friend Mickey O'Rooney, or else he was more mistaken than he had ever been in his life. But whatever doubts might have lingered with him were removed by the words that immediately followed. It beats the blazes where that young spalpeen can be capin' himself. 
Me and Mr. Simpson have been on the hunt for two days and more, and now when I got on his trail and found where he'd crawled into the bushes and I tried to do the same, I crawled into the biggest cellar in the whole world, and I can't find the stairs to walk out again. Hello, Mickey. Is that you, my old friend? called out the overjoyed lad, springing forward, throwing his arms about him, and breaking in most effectually upon his meditations. The Irishman was mystified for a moment, but he recognized the voice, reached down, and placed his arms in turn about the lad. "'Begorra, if this ain't the greatest surprise of me life, as Mr. O'Spangargamoch remarked when I called and paid him a little balance that I owed him. I've had a hard hunt for you, and had about give you up when I came down on you in this style. Freddy, my boy, I crave the privilege of axing you a question.' "'Ask me a thousand if you want,' replied the boy, dancing about with delight. "'Are you sure that it's yourself and nobody else? "'I don't want to make a mistake that'll cause me mortification, and you must answer carefully.' "'I'm sure it is I, Fred Munson.' "'Whoop! Hurrah!' shouted Mickey, leaping several feet in the air, and as he came down, striking at once into the chipperary jig. The overjoyed fellow kept it up for several minutes, making the cold, moist sand fly in every direction. He terminated the performance by a higher leap than ever and a regular Comanche war-hoop. Having vented his overflowing spirits in this fashion, the Irishman was ready to come down to something like more sober common sense. Reaching out, he took the hand of Fred, saying as he did so, "'Let me keep hold of your flipper so that I can prevent your drifting away.' Now tell me, my laddie, how did you get here? I came down the same way that you did, through the skylight up there. It's a handy way of going down the stairs, the only trouble being that it's sometimes inconvenient to stop so sudden-like. Didn't you observe the opening till you stepped into it? I didn't see it then. I was near it, asleep, and when I woke up in the night I crawled in under the bushes to shelter myself. When I went through into the cave, how was it you followed? I was searching for ye as I've been doing for the last two days and more. I observed the hole, for I had the daylight to help me, and I crawled up to take a pape down to see who lived there, when I must have gone too far, as me uncle observed, after he'd been hung in a joke, and the ground crumbled beneath me, and I slid in. But let me ask ye again, are ye much acquainted in these parts? You know I'm a stranger. I was never here before. I've looked around all I can, but haven't been able to find how big the cave is. There's a small waterfall, and the stream comes in and goes out somewhere, and there is one rent, at least, so deep that I don't believe it has any bottom. I've learned that much, and that's all. That's considerable for a laddie like you. Are you hungry? You better believe I am. Why had I better believe it? asked Mickey, with an assumption of gravity that it was impossible for him to feel. "'If you give me your word of honour, I'll believe you, because I've been hungry myself and know how it goes. I'll have some lunch with me, and if you don't fail above eating with common folks, we'll soup together.' "'I am so glad,' responded Fred, who was indeed in need of something substantial. "'I feel weak and hollow.' "'You shall have your fill. Take the word of an Irishman for that. Would you like to smoke? You know I never smoke, Mickey. Didn't ask you that question.' But if you doesn't feel inclined to do the seam, I'll indulge myself a little. The speaker had been preparing his pipe and tobacco while they were talking, and as he uttered the last words he twitched a match against the bowl and immediately began drawing at it. As the volumes of smoke issuing from his mouth showed that the flame had done its duty, he held the match aloft and looked down in the smiling upturned face of the lad scrutinizing the handsome countenance as long as the tiny bit of pine held out. "'Yes, it's your own lovely self, as Barney MacDugan's wife observed when he came home drunk with one eye punched out and his head cracked. Do you know that while I was surveying your sweet face I saw something behind you?' "'No, what was it?' demanded Fred, with a start and shudder, looking back in the darkness. "'Oh, it was nothing that'll harm you.' "'I think there be some bits of wood there that can be availed of in the way of kindling a fire, and that's what I misses more than anything else, as me mother used to say when she couldn't find the whisky bottle. Bestir yourself, me laddie, and assist me in getting together some scraps.' 
The Irishman was not mistaken in his supposition. Groping around, they found quite a quantity of sticks and bits of wood. All of these were dry and the best kind of kindling stuff that could be obtained. Mickey was never without his knife, and he whittled several of these until sure they would take the flame from a match when he made the essay. The fire caught readily, and carefully nursed it spread until it roared and crackled like an old-fashioned campfire. As it rose higher and higher, and the heavy gloom was penetrated and lit up by the vivifying rays, Mickey and Fred used their eyes to the best of their ability. The cave seemed to stretch away into fathomless darkness in every direction excepting one which was toward the waterfall or cascade. This appeared to be at one side instead of running through the center. The dark walls could be seen on the other side of the stream and the gleam and glitter of the water for some distance both above and below the plunge. "'Do you observe anything new?' asked Mickey. "'Nothing more than what I told you,' replied Fred, supposing he referred to the extent of the cavern. "'I have learned something,' said the man significantly. "'What's that?' "'Somebody's been here ahead of us. How do you know that?' "'I've got the proof. Will you note that right there before your eyes?' As he spoke, he pointed to the kindling wood, or fuel, of which they had collected considerable, while there was plenty more visible around them. Fred was not sure that he understood him, so he still looked questioningly toward him. "'Wood doesn't grow in such places as this no more than you can find Pratty's sprouting out of the side of a tea-kettle. But then it might have been pitched down the hole above or got drifted into it without anybody helping if it wasn't for the fact that there's been a campfire here before.' "'How do you make that out, Mickey?' The Irishman stooped down and picked up one of the pieces of wood which was waiting to be thrown upon the campfire. Holding it out, he showed that the end was charred. That isn't the only stick that's built after the same style, showing that this isn't the first campfire that was got up in these parts. There's been gentlemen here before to dee, and they must have had some way of coming and going that we haven't discovered as yet. There seemed nothing unlikely in this supposition of Mickey's, who picked up his rifle from where he had left it lying on the ground and stared inquiringly around in the gloom. "'I wonder whether there be any wild animals prowling around. I don't think that could be, for there couldn't many of them fall through that hole that let us in, and if they did they would soon die. That minds me that you hinted something about feeling the cravings of hunger, and I signified to you that I had something for you about my clothes, and so I have, if it isn't lost. As he spoke, he drew from beneath his waistcoat a package carefully wrapped about with an ordinary newspaper. Gently drawing the covering aside, he displayed a half dozen pieces of deer meat cooked to a turn. Will you take some? he asked, handing one to Fred, who could scarcely conceal his craving eagerness as he began masticating it. "'How comes it that you have that by you? I generally goes prepared for the most desperate emergencies, as me mither used to remark when she stowed the whiskey bottle away with the lunch she was taking with her. It was about the middle of yesterday afternoon that I fetched down a deer that was browsing on the bank of a small stream that I reached, and— as a matter of course, I made my dinner on him. I tried to lay up enough stock to last me for a week, that is, under my waistband, but I hadn't the room. So I sliced up several pieces, rather overcooked them so as to make em handy to carry, and then wrapped em up in the paper. It's a common-sense arrangement, added Mickey. I had the time and the chance to do it, and it was likely to happen that, when I wanted the next meal, I wouldn't have the same opportunity remembering which I did as I said, and the result is, I've brought your dinner to you. End of chapter 26 Read by Thomas Rose Chapter 27 of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 A Subterranean Campfire. There is no sauce like hunger, and after Fred Munson's experience of partial starvation and nausea from the wild berries which he had eaten, the venison was as luscious as it could be. 
It seemed to him that he had never tasted of anything he could compare to it. "'Fred, me laddie, tell me all that has happened to you since we met. Not that either, but since Lone Wolf snapped you up on his mustang and ran away with you. I wasn't about the city when the Apaches made their call being off on a hunt, as you will remember, so I didn't see all the sport, but I heard the same from Mr. Simpson.' Thus invited, the boy went over the narration already known, giving the full particulars of his adventures from the morning he opened his eyes and found himself in the camp of the Apaches in the mountains, to the hour when he slipped through from the upper earth into the cave below. Mickey listened with great interest, frequently interrupting and expressing his surprise and gratitude at the good fortune which seemed to succeed bad fortune in every case. You sometimes read of laddies like you getting out of the claws of these spalpeens, but you don't often see it, though you've been lucky enough to get out. Now, Mickey, tell me how it was that you came to get on my track. Well, you see, I got back to New Boston shortly after the rumpus. I would have been in time enough to have had a hand in the wind-up if it hadn't been that I got into a little circus of my own. Me and a couple of Apaches tried the game of cracking each other's heads that was spun out longer than we meant, and so as I was observing, when I rode into town the fun was all over. I found Mr. Simpson just getting ready to take your trail, and he asked me to do the same, and I was mighty glad to do it. I was desirous of bringing along your horse Hurricane for you to ride when we should get you, but Soot wouldn't hear of it. He said the horse would only be a bother, and if we should lay hands on to you, either of our horses was strong enough to take you, so we left the creature behind. Did you have any trouble in following us? Not at first. A hundred red spalpeens riding over the prairie can't any more hide their trail than an Irishman can save himself from cracking a head when he's invited to do so. We galloped along without ever scarcely looking at the ground. You know I've learned something of the perere business since we came west, and that was the kind of trail I could have followed with both eyes shut and me hands handcuffed, and no one as we needed to hurry. We put our mustangs to their best paces. How was it that you didn't overtake us? You had too much of a start. But when we struck the camp in the mountains, that is where Lone Wolf and his spalpeens took their breakfast, we wasn't a great way behind them. We swung along at a good pace, so trying to time ourselves so that we'd strike him about dark when he calculated there'd be a good chance to walk in on him. How was it you failed? We'd worked that thing as nice as anything you ever heard tell on, if Lone Wolf hadn't played a trick on us. We hadn't gone far on the trail among the mountains when we found that the Spalpeens had separated into two parties, three in one and something like a hundred in the other and you did not know which had charge of me. There couldn't be any certainty about it, and the best we could do was to make a guess. Soot got off his mustang and crawled round on his hands and knees, running his fingers over the ground, and looking down as careful like as me mither used to with my head, when she observed me scratching it more industrious than usual. He didn't see much, and after a time he came back to where his mustang was waiting, and Leaning again, the beast looked up in my face and asked me which party I thought you was in. I said the three, of course, and that was the reason why they'd gone off by themselves. You were right, then, of course. Yes, and when I answered, Soot, he just laughed kind of soft-like and said that that was the very reason why he did not believe you was with the three. He remarked that Lone Wolf was a mighty sharp old spalpeen. He knowed that Soot would be coming on his trail, and he divided up his party so as to bother him. Anybody would be apt to think just the same as I did, that the boy would be sent to the Injun town in charge of the little party, while the others went on to hatch up some diviltry. Lone Wolf knowed enough to do that, and he had therefore kept the laddie with the big company, meaning that his old friend the scout should go on a fool's errand. That's the way Soot raisined, you see, and that's where he missed it altogether. He wasn't ready for both of us to take the one trail, so it was agreed that we should also divide into two parties, he going after the big company and I after the small one, he figuring out that by so doing he could get all the heavy work to do and I wouldn't any. And there is where he missed it bad. There wasn't any way that we could fix it so that we could come together again, so the understanding was that 
each was to go on his own hook and get back to new busting the best way we could and if there wasn't any new busting to go to why we was to keep on till we reached fort severin which you know is about fifty miles beyond you understand that i was just as sartain that i was on your trail as soot was that he was gaining on you so we both worked our partiest i've been studying up this trailing business ever since we struck this side of the mississippi and i'd calculated that i'd learned something about such things i believe i could hang to the tracks of them three horsemen till i cotched up to em and nothing could throw me off but it wasn't long before i begun to get things mixed the trail bothered me and at last i was stunned altogether i begun to think that maybe soot was right after all and the best thing i could do was to turn round and cut for home but i kept the thing up until i struck a trail that led up into the mountains which i concluded was made by one of the spalpeens in toting you off on his shoulders that looked too as if the injun settlement was somewhere not far off and i begun to think again that soot was wrong and i right i kept the thing up till night when i hadn't discovered the first sign and not only that but had lost the trail and gone astray myself just as i did fred observed i pushed my mustang ahead mickey continued and he seemed to climb like a goat but there was some places where i had to get off and help him i struck a spot yesterday where there was the best of water and grass and the place looked so inviting that i turned him loose intending to leave him to rest till to-day while he was there i thought i may as well be taking observations around there making sartain not to get out of sight of the house so that i shouldn't get lost from him and is he near by not more than a mile away i was poking round like a thief in a pratty patch when i come unto a small place of south earth where sure as the sun shines i seed your footprint i knowed it by its smallness and by the print of them odd-shaped nails in your heel well, you see, that just set me wild. I knowed at once that by some hook or crook you'd give the spalpeens the slip, and was wandering round kind of lost like myself. So I started on the tracks and followed em till it got dark as best I could, though they sometimes led me over the rocks and hard earth in such a way that I could only guess at em. When night came I was pretty near this spot, but I was puzzled i couldn't tell where to look farther and i was afeard of getting off altogether so i contented myself with straying here and there and now and then giving out the signal you and me used to toot when we was off on hunts together when this morning arrived i struck signs again and at last found that your track led toward these bushes and thinks i to myself thinks i you'd crawled in there to take a snooze and the hover head to wake you up but i was too ambitious for me own good as was the case when i proposed to bridget o'flannigan and found that she'd been already married to tim mcgubbins a twelve month and had a pair of twins to boast of i own it wasn't a dignified and graceful way of coming downstairs but i was down before i made up my mind well mickey we are here and the great thing now is to get out can you tell any way the irishman took the matter very philosophically it would seem that any one who had dropped down from the outer world as had he would feel a trifle nervous but he acted as if he had kindled his campfire on the prairie with the certainty that no enemy was within a hundred miles when he and his young friend had eaten all they needed there was still a goodly quantity left which he folded up with as much care in the same piece of paper as though it were a tiara of diamonds we won't throw the to we just yet it's one of them things that me come into use as me mother used to say when she laid the brickbats with an easy reach and looked very knowingly at her old man after the completion of the meal man and boy occupied themselves for some time in gathering fuel for it was their purpose to keep the fire going continually so long as they remained in the cave that is if the thing were possible there was an immense quantity of wood it had probably been thrown in from above as coal is shoveled into the mouth of a furnace and it must have been intended for the use of parties who had been in the cave before when they had gathered sufficiently to last them for a good while mickey lit his pipe and they sat down by the fire to discuss the situation the temperature was comfortable there being no need of the flames to lessen the cold 
but there was a certain tinge of dampness natural to such a location that made the fire grateful not alone for its cheering enlivening effect but for its power in dissipating the slight peculiarity alluded to seated thus the better portion of an hour was occupied by them in talking over the past and interchanging experiences the substance of which had already been given they were thus engaged when mickey who seemed to discover so much from specimens of the fuel which they had gathered picked up another stick which was charred at one end and carefully scrutinized it as though it contained an important sermon intended for his benefit End of chapter twenty seven read by thomas rose chapter twenty eight of in the pecos country by edward ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty eight the exploring tour after gently tossing the stick in his hand like one who endeavors to ascertain its weight mickey smelled of it and finally bit his teeth into it with a very satisfactory result no that's what i call lucky as the old miser observed when he found he was going to save his dinner by dying in the forenoon do you mind that shtick big enough to sarve as a respectable shillelagh at donnybrook fair well my laddie that has done duty as a lantern in this very place as a torch you mean precisely just heft it as he tossed it into fred's hand the latter was astonished to note its weight what is the cause of that he inquired it's a piece of pine and it's chuck full of pitch that's why it's so heavy it'll burn like the biggest kind of a candle and me plan me laddie is to sit that a fire and then start out to larn something about this new house nothing could have suited the boy better he sprang to his feet and took the gun from mickey so as to leave him free to carry the torch one end of the latter was thrust into the fire and it caught as readily as if it were smeared with alcohol it was a bit of pine as fat as it could be and as a torch could not have been improved upon then mickey elevated it above his head it gave forth a long yellow smoky blaze which answered admirably the purpose for which it was required i'll take the lead said he to his young friend when they were ready to start you follow a few yards behind and look as sharp as you can to find out all there is to be found out you know there is much that depends on this there was no possibility of fred failing to use all his senses to the utmost and he told his friend to go ahead and do the same mickey first headed toward the cascade as he had some hope of learning something in that direction reaching the base of the falls they paused a while to contemplate them there was nothing noteworthy about them except their location underneath the ground the water fell with such a gentle sound that the two were able to converse in ordinary tones when standing directly at the base both knelt down and tasted the cool and refreshing element and then mickey torch in hand led the way upstream again through this world of gloom the two made their way with considerable care mickey cherished a lingering suspicion that there might be some one else in the cave besides themselves in which case he and fred would offer the best target possible but he was willing to incur the risk and although he moved slowly it was with a decision to see the thing through and learn all that was to be learned about the cave the stream was followed about a hundred yards above the falls when the explorers reached the point where it entered the cave and the two made the closest examination possible. On the way to the point the two had acquired considerable information. The roof of their underground residence had a varying height from the floor of from twenty to fifty feet. The floor itself was irregular, but not sufficiently so to prevent their walking over it with comparative ease. The stream was only five or six feet in width, and wherever examined was found to be quite shallow, it flowed at a moderate rate and it entered the cavern from beneath a rock that ascended continuously from the floor to the roof freddy me laddie do you take this torch and walk off a ways so that it will be dark here said mickey to his companion the latter obeyed and the man made as critical an examination as he could 
His object was to learn whether the water came into the cave from the outer world, or whether its source was beneath the rock. If the former, there was possibly a way out by means of the stream, provided the distance intervening was not too great. Mickey thought that if this distance were passable, there would be some glimmer of light to indicate it. But when left alone in the darkness, he found that there was not the slightest approach to anything of the kind, and he was compelled to acknowledge that all escape by that direction was utterly out of the question. Accordingly, he called Fred to him, and they began the descent of the stream. When they reached the falls, they paused below them, and Mickey held the torch close to the water, where it was quiet enough for them to observe the bottom. "'Tell me whether ye can see anything resembling fishes?' The lad peered into the water a minute, and then caught a flash of silver several times. "'Yes, there's plenty of them!' he exclaimed, as the number increased, and they shot forward from every direction, drawn to the one point by the glare of the torch. "'There's enough fish for us, if we can only find some way to get them out.' "'That's the rub,' said Mickey, scratching his head in perplexity. "'I don't notice any fish-lines and hooks about here. "'Howsomever, we can wait a while, being as our venison isn't all gone, "'and we'll look downstream, for there's where our main chance must be.' The Irishman, somehow or other, had formed the idea that the outlet of the water would show them a way of getting out of the cavern. Despite his careless and indifferent disposition, he showed considerable anxiety as he led the way along the bank, holding the smoking torch far above his head and lighting up the gloom and darkness for a long distance on every hand. "'When your eye rests on anything interesting, call me attention to the seam,' he cautioned him. "'I'll be sure to do that,' replied Fred, who let nothing escape him. The scenery was gloomy and oppressive, but acquired a certain monotony as they advanced. The dark water, throwing back the light of the torch, the towering massive rocks overhead and on every hand, the jagged irregular roof and floor, these were the characteristics of the scene that was continually opening before and closing behind them. In several places the brook spread out into a slowly flowing pond of fifty or a hundred feet in width, but it maintained its progress all the time. At no point which they examined did the depth of the water appear greater than three feet, while in most places it was less than that. It preserved its crystal-like clearness at all times, and in all respects was a beautiful stream. When they had advanced a hundred yards or so, the campfire which they had left behind them took on a strange and unnatural appearance. It seemed far away, and burned with a pale yellow glare that would have seemed supernatural had it been contemplated by any one of a superstitious turn. As near as Mickey could estimate, they had gone over a hundred and fifty yards when the point was reached where the stream gathered itself and passed from view. Its width was no greater than four feet, while its rapidity was correspondingly increased. After Mickey had contemplated it a while by the light of the torch, he handed the latter to Fred, and told him to go off so far that he would be left in total darkness. This being done, the man set to work to study out the problem before him. His theory was that if the passage of the stream from the cavern to the outside world were brief, the evidence of it could be seen, perhaps, in the faintest tinge of light in the water. The sun was shining brightly on the outside, and unless the stream flowed quite a distance underground, a portion of the refracted light would reach his eye. Mickey peered at the base of the rock for a few minutes, and then exclaimed with considerable excitement, "'Be the powers, but it's there!' It was dim and faint as light is sometimes seen through a translucent substance, but he saw it so plainly that there could be no error. When he looked aloft at the impenetrable gloom, he was sensible of the same dim light upon the water. He tested his accuracy of vision by looking in different directions, but the result was the same every time. The almost invisible illumination being there, the Irishman wanted no philosopher to tell him that it was the sun striking the water as it reached the outside, and the outer world which he was so desirous of re-entering was close at hand. Mickey was in high glee at the discovery, 
but when he regained his mental poise he could not shut his eyes to the fact that if he attempted to reach the outer world by means of the stream he ran a terrible risk of losing his life there was no vacancy between the water and the stone which shut down upon it the outlet was like an open faucet to a full barrel the escaping fluid filled up all the space at command no one can live long without air a few seconds of suspended respiration is fatal to the strongest swimmer if the distance travelled by mickey when he should attempt to dive or float through to the outer world should prove a trifle too long the stream would cast out a dead man instead of a live one but he was a person of thorough grit and before he would consent to see himself and fred imprisoned in this cavern he would make the attempt perilous as it was was there no other way of escape was there not some opening which had been used by those who had entered this cave ahead of him or was it possible that the imprisoning walls were so thin and shell-like in some places that there was a means of forcing their way out or was there no plan of climbing up the side of the prison and reaching the opening in the roof through which they could clamber to safety these and other thoughts were surging through the mind of mickey o'rooney when an exclamation from fred caused him to turn his head the boy was running toward him apparently in great excitement what's the matter me laddie asked mickey cocking his rifle which he had taken from him at the time of handing him the torch oh mickey mickey i saw a man just now End of chapter twenty eight read by thomas rose Chapter Twenty Nine of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Nine A Mystery. O'Rooney stood with rifle grasped while young Munson ran toward him from the center of the cave, exclaiming in his excited tones, There's another man back yonder. I saw him and spoke to him did you ax him anything and did he make a sensible reply demanded the irishman whose concern was by no means equal to that of the lad he made no answer at all nor did he seem to take any notice of me maybe it's a ghost walking round the cave on the same errand as myself but whist now where is he that i may go and ax him the state of his health the lad turned to lead the way while mickey followed close at his heels his gun ready to be used at an instant warning while fred kept glancing over his shoulder to make sure that his friend was not falling too far in the rear it seemed that while the man was engaged in his exploration the lad had ventured upon a little prowling expedition of his own during this he made the startling discovery that some one else was in the cave and he dashed off at once to notify his friend and guide fred walked some distance further still holding the torch above his head and peering into the gloom ahead and on either hand as though in doubt as to whether he was on the right track or not all at once he stopped with a start of surprise and pointing some distance ahead and upon the ground said there he is Following the direction indicated, Mickey saw the figure of a man stretched out upon the ground, face downward as though asleep. "'You ain't afeard of it, did, Spalpeen?' demanded Mickey with a laugh. "'You might have knowed from his style that he's as dead as poor Thompson was when Lone Wolf made a call on him.' "'How do you know he's dead?' asked Fred, whose terror was not lessened by the word of his friend. "'Cause he couldn't have stretched out that way and kept it up all the time we've been fooling round here. If you entertain any doubt, I'll prove it. Let me have your torch." Taking it from the lad's trembling hand, he walked to the figure, stooped down, and, taking it by the shoulder, turned it over upon its back. The result was rather startling even to such a brave man as Mickey. It was not a dead man which the two looked down upon, but practically a skeleton, the remains of an individual who perhaps had been dead for years. Some strange property of the air had desiccated the flesh, leaving the face bare and staring, while the garments seemed scarcely the worse for their long exposure. Another noticeable feature was the fact that the clothing of the remains showed that not only was he a white man, 
but also that he was not a hunter or frontier character such as were about the only ones found in that section of the country the coat vest and trousers were of fine dark cloth the boots were of thin superior leather the cap was gone it was just such a dress as is encountered every day in our public streets mickey o'rooney contemplated the figure for a time in silence he was surprised and puzzled where could this person have come from there was nothing about his dress to show that he belonged to the military service else it might have been supposed that he was some officer who had wandered away from his post and had been caught in the same fashion as had the man and boy are there any more around here asked mickey in a subdued tone peering off into the gloom fred passed slowly round in a circle gradually widening out until he had passed over quite an area but without discovering anything further there isn't any one else near us if there is he's in some other part of the cave how came you to find this fella i was walking along never thinking of anything of the kind when i came near stepping upon the body i was never more scared in my life that's the way with some of yous you're more affrighted at a dead man than a live one let's see whether he has left anything that you can identify him by upon examining further a silver-mounted revolver was found beneath the body it was untarnished and seemingly as good as the day it was completed when Mickey came to look at it more closely, he found that only one barrel had been discharged, all the others being loaded. This fact aroused a suspicion, and looking again at the head, a round hole such as would have been made only by a bullet was found in the very center of the forehead. There could be but little doubt, then, that this man, whoever he was, had wandered about the cavern until famished and despairing of any escape had deliberately sent himself out of the world by means of the weapon at his command but who was he laying the handsome pistol aside mickey continued the search anxious to find something that would throw light upon the history of the man it was probable that he had a rifle but it was not to be found and perhaps had vanished as had that of fred munson it was more likely that something could be found in his pockets that would throw some light upon the question, and the Irishman, having undertaken the job, went through it to the end. It was not the pleasantest occupation in the world to ransack the clothing of a skeleton, and he who was doing it could not help reflecting as he did so that it looked very much like a desecration and a robbing of the dead. To his great disappointment, however, he failed to discover anything which would give the slightest clue. It looked as if the man had purposely destroyed all such articles before destroying himself, and after a thorough search Mickey was compelled to give up the hunt. Five chambers of the revolver, as has been said, were still loaded, and after replacing the caps the new owner was confident they were good for that number of shots. Here, said he, handing the weapon to the boy, your rifle is gone and you may as well take charge of this it may come as handy as a shillelagh in a scrimmage so you does hold on to the same fred took it rather gingerly for he did not fancy the idea of going off with property taken from a dead man but he suffered his friend to persuade him and the arrangement was made in the belief that there might be others somewhere around Mickey spent an hour or two longer in an exploration of the cave with the single purpose of looking for bodies. They approached the ravine in which Fred had dropped his gun. The Irishman leaped across, torch in hand, and prosecuted his search along that side, but they were compelled to give over after a time and conclude that only a single individual had preceded them in the cave. "'Where he came from must ever remain a mystery,' said Mickey. He hasn't been the kind of chaps you find in this part of the world, but whoever he was, it must have been his luck to drop through the skylight just as we did. He must have found the wood here and kindled a fire, and then he went tramping round looking for some place to find his way out and kept it up until he made up his mind it was no use. Then he acted like a gentleman who preferred to be shot to starving and finding nobody around to tend to the business, done it himself. Can we bury him, Mickey? He's buried already. 
The Irishman meant nothing especial in his reply, but there was a deep significance about it which sent a shudder through his hearer from head to foot. Yes, the stranger was buried, and in the same grave with him were Mickey O'Rooney and Fred Munson. The speaker saw the effect his words had produced, and attempted to remove their sting. "'It looks very much to me as if the man hadn't done anything but tramp, tramp, without trying any way of getting out, and then he had keeled over and give up.' Well, "'What could he do, Mickey? Couldn't they have jumped into the stream and made a dive? He stood a chance of coming up outside, and if he hadn't, he would have been as well off as he is now.' "'Is that what you mean to do?' I will before I give up as he did, but it's myself that thinks there's some other way of finding our way. Bring me gun along and come with me. Mickey carried the torch because he wished to use it himself. He led the way back to where the stream disappeared from view, and there he made another careful examination, his purpose being different from what it had been in the first place. He stooped over and peered at the dark walls, noting the width of the stream and the contour of the bank, as well as the level of the land on the right. Evidently he had some scheme which he was considering. He said nothing, but spent fully a half-hour in his self-imposed task, during which Fred stood in the background trying to make out what he was driving at. He saw that Mickey was so intensely occupied that he was scarcely conscious of the presence of anyone else and he did not attempt to disturb him. Suddenly the Celt roused himself from his abstraction, and turning to the expectant lad, abruptly asked, "'Do you know me, laddie, that it is dinner-time?' "'I feel as though it was, but we have no means of judging the time, being as neither of us carries a watch. "'Come on,' added the Irishman, leading in the direction of the campfire. I'm sorry you didn't bring my watch with me, but the trouble was I was afeard that it might tire out my horse, for it was of goodly size. The last time it got out of order it took a blacksmith in the old country nearly a week to mend it. It was rather large, but it would have been handy. Whenever we wanted to cook anything we could have used the case for a stew pan, or we could have boiled eggs in the same, and when we started our hotel at New Boston it would have done for a gong. It was rather tiresome to wind up nights, as the key didn't give you much leverage, and if your hold happened to slip you was likely to fall down and hurt yourself, but here we are, as Jimmy O'Donovan said when he joined his father and mother in jail. End of chapter 29 Read by Thomas Rose Chapter 30 of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 Discussions and Plans When they reached the campfire, it had burned so low that they threw on considerable more wood before sitting down to their lunch. As it flamed up and the cheerful light forced the oppressive gloom back from around them, both felt a corresponding rise in spirits. "'It was lucky that I brought along that mate,' remarked Mickey, as he produced the venison already cooked and prepared for the palate. "'It's a custom that Mr. Soot Simpson showed me, and I like it very much. You'll note that the mate would be a great deal better if we had some salt and pepper, if we could keep it a few days till it got tender. But as it is, I think we'll worry it down.' "'It seems to me that I never tasted anything better,' responded Fred. But that, I suppose, is because I became so hungry before tasting it. Yes, all right. If you want to know how good a cup of water can taste, go two days without drinking. Or if you want to enjoy a good night's rest, sit up for two nights. And so, if you want to enjoy a nice meal of victuals, you must fast for a day or two. Now I don't need any fasting, for I always enjoyed eating from the first pratty they give me to suck when I was a few weeks old. Well, Mickey, you've been pretty well around the cave, and I want to know what you think of our chance of getting out. The face of the Irishman became serious, and he looked thoughtfully into the fire a moment before answering. Disposed as he was to view everything from the sunshiny side, Mickey was not such a simpleton as to consider their incarceration in the cave a matter that could be passed off with a quip and jest. He had explored the interior pretty thoroughly and gained a correct idea of their situation, 
but as yet he saw no practical way of getting out. The plan of diving down the stream and trusting to Providence to come up on the outside was to be the last resort. Mickey did not propose to undertake it until convinced that no other scheme was open to him. In going about the cave he struck the walls in hope of finding some weak place, but they all gave forth that dead sound which would have been heard had they been backed up by fifty feet of solid granite. Among the many schemes that he had turned over in his mind, none gave as little promise as this, and he dismissed it as utterly impracticable. He could conjure no way of reaching that opening above their heads. He could not look up at that irregular, jagged opening without thinking how easy it would be to rescue them if they could make their presence known to someone outside. There was Sut Simpson, who must have learned that he had gone upon the wrong trail, and who had, therefore, turned back to the assistance of his former comrade. The latter knew him to be a veteran of the prairie, one who could read signs that to others were like a sealed book, and whose long years of adventure with the tribes of the southwest had taught him all their tricks. But whether he would be likely to follow the two and to understand their predicament was a question which Mickey could not answer with much encouragement to himself. Still there was a possibility of its being done, and now and then the Irishman caught himself looking up at the skylight with a longing, half-expectant gaze. There were several other schemes which he was turning over in his mind, none of which, however, had taken definite shape, and, not wishing to discourage his young friend, he answered his question as best he could. "'Well, me laddie, we're going to have a hard time to get out, but I think we'll do it. But can you tell me how?' Mickey scratched his head in his perplexed way, hardly feeling competent to come down to particulars. "'I can't exactly.' I've a good many plans I'm turning over in my head, and some of them are very fine and grand, and it's hard to pick out the right one. Fred felt that he would like to hear what some of them were, but he did not urge his friend, for he suspected that the fellow was trying to keep their courage up. They had finished their meal, and were sitting upon the sandy soil, discussing the situation, and throwing an occasional longing look at the opening above. They had taken care to avoid getting directly beneath it, for they had no wish to have man or animal tumble down upon their heads. Now and then some of the gravel loosened and rattled down, and the clear light that made its way through the overhanging bushes showed that the sun was still shining, and no doubt several hours still remained to them in which to do any work that might present itself. But unfortunately nothing remained to do. Whatever were the different schemes which Mickey was turning over in his mind, none of them was ripe enough to experiment with. As the Irishman thought of this and that, he decided to make no special effort until the morrow. He and Fred could remain where they were without inconvenience for a day or two longer, but it was necessary, too, that they should have their full strength of body and mind when the time should come to work. "'Sometimes when I get into a sore puzzle,' said Mickey, and so many beautiful and irritating plans come up before me that I cannot find it in my heart which way to decide, I goes to sleep and dreams me way through it, right straight into the right way. Did you ever find your path out of trouble? inquired Fred. Very frequently, that is to say, not so frequently, but on one or two important occasions. I mind the time when I was courting Bridget O'Flaherty and Molly McFizzle in the old country. Both of them was fine gals, and the trouble was for me to decide which was the best as a helpmate to myself. Bridget had red hair and beautiful freckles and a turn-up nose, and she was so fond of going around without shoes that her feet spread out like boards. Molly was just as handsome, but her beauty was of another style. She had very little hair upon her pad, and a little love pat she had with an old bow of hers caused a broken nose, which made her countenance quite picturesque. She was also cross-eyed, and when she cocked one eye down at me while she kept a watch on the door with the other, there was a loveliness about her which is not often seen in the female form. And you couldn't decide which of these would make you the best wife? Nary a once. The attraction of both was nearly equal. But how about their housekeeping? I've often heard father tell what a splendid housekeeper mother was, and how he would rather have his wife a good housekeeper than beautiful. 
But the trouble was, I had both. I've described ye the charms and grace of each, and when I add that both were elegant housekeepers, ye'll admit that my dilemma was greater than ever. They both handled the broom to perfection. They could knock a chap clean across the cabin and out the window before ye could know what was coming. Me mother used to say it was the housekeeping qualities that should decide, and she told me to call upon em some time when they wasn't expecting me and observe the manner in which they handled things. While well, Bridget was the first one that I sneaked in upon, I heard a thumping noise as I drew near, as though something was tumbling about the floor, and when I peeped through the door I saw that Bridget and her mother was having a delightful love patch. They was banging and wailing each other around the room, and as the old lady had her muscle well up, it was hard to tell which was coming out ahead. Of course my sympathies were with the lovely Bridget, and I was desirous that she should win, but I didn't consider it my duty to interfere. I suppose the old lady had been trying to impose too much work on Bridget, and therefore she had rebelled, and was lambasting her for the seam. My interest in the little affair was so great that I pushed the door ajar and stood with me mouth and eyes wide open. It wasn't long before I began to get worried, for from the way things looked the old lady was getting the upper hand. I was thinking I would have to sail in and lend a helping hand when Bridget fetched the old lady a whack that made her throw up the sponge. With that I felt so proud that I sung out a word of encouragement and rushed forward to embrace my angel, but before I could do so she gave me a swipe that sent me backward through the door, busting it off, and I was out to the ring. The interview was very satisfactory, continued Mickey, and I went over to take a sly peep at Molly. As I drawed near the little hut on the edge of the wood, I didn't hear any such noise as I noticed over at Bridget's house. All was as still as it is here this minute. My first thought was that they all had gone away, but when I got nearer I noted my mistake. Molly's mother was busy sewing, and sitting near her was her charming daughter Molly, leaning back in her chair with her head thrown still further back, her mouth wide open, and she a snoring. I've no doubt that she had become exhausted from overwork and was taking a little nap. The mother looked up as I stepped softly in, and I asked her in an undertone how long her pit child had been asleep. She said between two or three hours, and that she would wake her up if Molly hadn't told her before closing her eyes that if she dared disturb her before her nap was finished she'd break the old lady's head. Knowing the delicate relations that existed between us, she suggested that I should arouse her, she being afraid that she would sleep so long that she would starve to death before she awoke. I wanted to come at the matter gently, so I took a straw and tickled Molly's nose. She snorted a little and rubbed it with her fist, but didn't open her eyes. I undertook the job, however, and I was bound to do it or day. I wiggled at her nostrils, and she made a yell and a jump and was wide awake. I don't mind me all that took place just then. Things was kind of confused, and when Molly lit on me I thought the cabin had tumbled in. My senses came back after a while, and when I got my head bandaged up I went home to dream over it. "'And what was your dream?' asked Fred. "'In my slumbers I saw both my loves going for each other like a couple of Kilkenny cats until there was nothing of either left. I took that as a sign that neither of them was interested for me. So I give them up, sneaking off and sailing for America before they learned my intentions.' End of Chapter 30 Read by Thomas Rose Chapter 31 of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31 An Exchange of Shots. Mickey proposed to act upon his own suggestion, which was to go to sleep as soon as the day ended and discuss the many different plans during his slumbers. He had a strong hope that the right one could be hit upon by this method. Somehow or other his thoughts were fixed upon the stream, where it disappeared under the rocks, and, leaving Fred by the campfire, he relit his torch and went off to make another survey. The lad watched the star-like point of light flickering in the gloom as his friend moved along, holding the torch over his head. 
It seemed to the watcher that when it paused they were separated by nearly a half-mile. The light had an odd way of vanishing and remaining invisible for several minutes that made him think that some accident had befallen the bearer, or that the light had gone out altogether, but after a time it would reappear, dancing about in a way to show that the bearer was not idle in his researches. Mickey O'Rooney was indeed active. After making his way to the point he was seeking, he shied off to the right and approached the chasm down which Fred had lost his rifle. As he stood on the edge of the rent in the fathomless darkness, he loosened a boulder with his foot, and as it toppled over listened for the result. The way was so narrow that it bounded like a ball from side to side, and the Irishman heard it as it went lower and lower, until at last the strained ear could detect nothing more. There was no sound that came to him to show that it had reached the bottom. "'I suppose it's going yet,' reflected Mickey, after listening several minutes, "'and no doubt it will keep on until it comes out somewhere in Chiney, which I've been told is on t'other side of the world. "'Now why couldn't we do the same?' he asked himself with a sharp turn of the voice. "'If that stone is on its way to Chiney, why can't we folly on after it? "'If we can't reach the crust of the world at this point, "'what's to hinder our going round by Chiney? "'That's what I'd like to know. "'I wonder how long it would take us. "'I suppose we'd get up pretty good steam and go faster and faster "'so that we wouldn't be many days on the road. "'But there's one great objection,' he added, "'scratching his head and knitting his brow with thought. "'There's nothing to stop us from bouncing from side to side like that stone.' "'If the way is rough, we'd be pretty sartin to get our breeches pretty well ripped off us, and by the time we reach China we wouldn't be in a condition to be presented in court. And then, too, I haven't enough money about me to pee my way home again.' The visionary scheme was one of those which grew less in favour the more he reflected upon it, and, after turning it over for some minutes longer, he was naturally compelled to abandon the idea. "'I must try the stream again,' he said, as he rose to his feet and groped his way back. "'That seems to be the best door after all, though it ain't the kind I hanker after.' He thrust one end of the torch in the ground some distance away, and walked to the bank close to the great rock beneath which the stream dove and disappeared. Stooping down, he observed the same dull white appearance that had caught his eye in the first place. Beyond question, this was caused by the sunlight striking the water from the outside. I could almost swear that a fellow wouldn't have to go more than twenty feet before he'd strike daylight, mused Mickey as he folded his arms and looked thoughtfully at the misty relief of the surrounding darkness. And it wouldn't take much more to persuade me to make the dive and try it. As Mickey stood there, contemplating as best he could the darkly flowing stream, and debating the matter with himself, he was on the very eve of making the attempt fully half a dozen times. It seemed to him that he could not fail, and yet there was something in the project which held him back. The stream at that point flowed quite rapidly, and the strongest swimmer, after venturing a few feet under water, would be utterly unable to return. Once started, there would be no turning back, so he concluded not to make the decisive trial just yet. "'The day is pretty nearly ended, and I will dream over it. I told me, laddie, that that was my favorite way of getting out of such a scrape, and I'll try it. If there's no plan that presents itself by tomorrow, then I'll try it then, or the day after.' Going to where his torch was still burning in the sand, he drew it out and moved back toward his old campfire. "'Well, me laddie, how have you made out during me absence, have you?' He paused and looked about him. "'Begorra, but no laddie is here. Can it be that he has strayed off and started to chain you so as to hid me off? I say, Fred, me laddie, have you? Shh, shh!' And as the hurried aspirate was uttered, the boy came running silently out of the darkness with his hand raised in a warning way. "'What is it?' asked Mickey in amazement. "'Have you found another dead man?' "'No, he's a live one.' "'What do you mean? Explain yourself.' The lad pointed to the opening over their heads and motioned to his friend not to draw too near the campfire. 
There was danger in doing so. There's somebody up there, he added, and they're looking for us. Are you sure of that? asked the Irishman, not a little excited at the news. It may be that Soot Simpson has found us. Begorra, if there isn't any mistake about it, as me uncle remarked when he heard that the ship with his wife on was lost at sea, then I'll execute the Donnybrook jig in the highest style of the art. What was it that aroused your suspicion that some gentleman was unmannerly enough to be paping down on us? I was sitting here watching you, or, or rather your torch, and all the time the gravel kept rattling down faster and faster till I knowed there was something more than usual going on up there, and I sneaked away from the fire where I could get a better look. I went right under the place and was about to see something worth seeing when some dirt dropped plump into my eye and I couldn't see anything for a while. After I'd rubbed the grit out, I took another look, and I know I saw something moving up there. "'What did it look like?' asked Mickey, who was moving cautiously around, with his gaze fixed upon the same opening. "'I couldn't tell, though I tried hard to get a glimpse. It seemed to me that someone had a stick in his hand and was beating around the edges of the opening as though he wanted to knock the loose dirt off. I could see the stick flirted about and fancied I could see the hand that was holding it, though I couldn't be certain of that. "'No, that's a little too much,' as me mither observed when me brother Tim said he and myself had got along a whole half-day without fighting, and then she wailed us both for lying. You couldn't tell a man's hand at that distance, but I see nothing of him, and I should like you to tell me where he's gone. Well, that's what puzzles me. Maybe he's afraid that we will see him.' Mickey was hardly disposed to accept such an explanation. It seemed to him more likely that it was some wild animal mousing around the orifice and displacing the dirt with his paws, although he couldn't understand why an animal should be attracted by such a spot. "'It may be one of the spalpeens that got us into all this trouble,' he added, still circling slowly about with his eyes fixed upon the opening. "'Those Apaches are sharp-eyed, and perhaps one of their warriors has struck our trail and tracked us to that spot.' If it's the same, then I doesn't see what he is to gain by fooling round up there. If he'd be kind enough to let a lasso down that we could climb up by, there'd be some sense in the scene, but to the horror of them both at that instant there was a flash at the opening over their heads, a dull report, and the bullet buried itself in the very center of the campfire. Begorra, but that's what I call cheek, as Ned McGowan used to see when the folks axed him to pay his dits. While we are looking about and axing ourselves whether there's anybody at all around us, one of the spalpeens sends his bullet down here, coming closer to us than is pleasant. Did you observe him? I saw nothing but the flash. Do you think they could see us? Not where we are now. We're too far away from the light. They've seen the fire, and by that token they've concluded that we must be somewhere near it. But there was but one shot. Why not more? We'll get the rest of thine arter a while. That's a sort of failure thrown out to see how we take it, as Larry O'Luligan used to say when he knocked a man down. Now do you stand aside, and I'll answer em. You'd better not, protested Fred. They can tell where we are by the flash of our guns. Whooshed now, can't we move? Keep back in the dark lake. The lad moved away several steps, and Mickey, who made sure that his form was not revealed by the light of his own campfire, circled around to the other side of the opening, which he was watching with the keenest interest. His purpose was to catch a glimpse of the wretch who had fired the shot, but that seemed about impossible. He could detect something moving now and then, and once or twice there was a twinkle of something red, like the eagle feather in the hair of a warrior, but he could make out nothing definitely. "'He's there, and all I want to do is to be sartin of hitting him,' he muttered as he held the cocked rifle to his shoulder. "'I'm afeard that if I miss he'll take such good care of himself that I won't get another chance.' "'There, Mickey, there's something,' broke in Fred, who was scrutinizing the opening as closely as he could. "'Fire quick, or you won't get the chance.' The words were scarcely uttered when the Irishman, who had already taken aim, pulled the trigger, instantly lowering his piece to watch the result. Both he and Fred fancied they heard an exclamation, but they could not be certain. There was no perceptible commotion about the skylight, but the flickering, erratic movement which had puzzled them ceased on the instant. 
Whether the shot had accomplished anything or not could only be conjectured, but Mickey was of the opinion that the exchange was equally without result in both cases. End of chapter 31 Read by Thomas Rose Chapter 32 of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 Footsteps in the Darkness. The direct result of this exchange of shots was to make the two parties more cautious. Mickey and Fred kept further away from the campfire, which they suffered to die out gradually. There was really no need for it, and since its presence meant danger, it was only prudent to dispense with it altogether. For fully a half-hour not the slightest movement or disturbance at the opening betrayed the presence of any one there, although there could be no doubt that their enemies were within call. "'I can't see what they can gain by loafing around them parts, as the lassies used to observe in the old country when any of the laddies tried to cut me out with them. They needn't watch for us to come out that way, for there ain't much danger of our trying to steal out of that hole. Hello, look there, exclaimed Fred, with considerable excitement. Some of them are coming down to catch us. Mickey had already noticed that something unusual was up, and just as the lad spoke, the figure of what seemed to be a man blocked up the opening, and then began slowly descending, as if supported by a rope with which his friends were lowering him into the lower room. His form was swathed with a blanket, and there was a certain majesty in the slowly sinking figure which would have been very impressive but for the fact that it was hardly started when the thin cord by which it was suspended began to twist and untwist, causing the form to revolve forward and backward in a way that was fatal to dignity. On the impulse of the moment the Irishman had raised his gun to fire the moment his eyes rested upon the figure, but he restrained himself, not a little puzzled to guess the meaning of such a proceeding. The man, as they believed him to be, was slowly lowered until something like a dozen feet below the opening, where those who had him in charge seemed to think was the proper place to hold him on exhibition for a time. "'Are you going to shoot?' asked the boy, who did not understand the delay. "'What's the use?' he asked, with an expression of disgust. "'Why, it'll stop the man coming down on us. "'Man, do you see? "'He ain't any more a man than me gun is. "'What, then, can he be? "'Here's a blanket that they've twisted up to look as though it's gathered about the shoulders of an Apache. "'It's easy to say that there's nothing in it from the way it swings around as though it was a little toy. "'And by the same token, that little cord which holds him aloft is no thicker than a darning needle. "'Why they are trying such a simple trick is more than I can tell.' "'I think I know,' said Fred. "'They've dropped him down to find out whether we're on the watch or not. "'If we didn't pay any attention to it, "'they would think that neither of us was on the lookout, "'and they would send some others down to scalp us.' "'By the powers, my laddie, I believe you're right,' "'exclaimed Mickey admiringly. "'That's just the plan of the spalpains, "'by which token I'll tip him a shot.' With this he raised his rifle, and, sighting rather carelessly, fired. The shot, which was aimed at the roll of blanket, missed it altogether, and cut the string which held it suspended in mid-air. The next moment there was a dull thump upon the sand, and the package lay at the feet of the Irishman, who gave it a kick to make sure of its nature. It rebounded several feet, the resistance to the blow showing that there was nothing more than the simple blanket, and then he stooped over and examined it more closely by the sense of touch. "'Twas very kind of the spalpains to furnish us with a blanket that seems as good as this, though the weather ain't so cold that we need it just now. But sometimes the rain comes, and the northers blow, and then a chap is mighty glad to have such a convenient article about. "'Twas very kind, I say." The result of the little experiment on the part of the Apaches, it was apparent, was not satisfactory to them. The boy was right in his surmise of its purpose, but it cannot be supposed that they counted upon losing the blanket under any circumstances. It was a costly and beautiful one, such as are made by the Indians of the Southwest, and it was new enough to be clean, so that the two fugitives had secured a prize. 
At all events, the Apaches must have concluded that the people below were keeping watch and ward so well that no one could descend into the cave without danger of being perforated by a rifle ball. Shortly after this occurrence, it began to grow dark above, but the cause was obvious. The day was drawing to a close. Darkness, only less profound than that within the cave below, was enwrapping the surface above. As soon as the night had fairly descended, Mickey O'Rooney, handling a small torch with great care, made his way once more to the puzzling outlet of the underground stream. The inspection satisfied him of the accuracy of his theory. Not the slightest tinge of light relieved the impenetrable gloom. Mickey considered this strong proof that it was but a short distance to the free air outside, and his courage rose very nearly to the sticking point of making the experiment then and there. "'But we both need sleep,' he mused, as he threw down his torch and made his way back by the dull glare of the expiring campfire. "'We both lost considerable last night, and a chap can't keep regular hours any more than he can when he's courting three lassies at the same time and trying to keep each from suspecting it.' I feel as though we shall have something lively to do to-morrow, and so we'd better gain all the slumber we can. When he reached the camp, he found the lad anxiously awaiting his return. They had signaled to each other several times, but the presence of the danger overhead rendered the boy more uneasy than usual when they were apart. "'Have you observed nothing?' asked Mickey in an undertone. "'Nothing at all. It's too dark, I know, to see.' "'But maybe yous have heard something to tell you that the spalpeens are up there still. "'You may be sure I listened all I know how, but everything has kept as still as the grave. "'I haven't heard the fall of a pebble even. "'What do you think the Indians mean to do?' "'Well, it's hard to tell. "'It looks as though they didn't think we fell in, but had come down on purpose "'and had some way of getting out as easy, and they're on the lookout for us.' "'Maybe, Mickey, there's some other way of coming in that we haven't been able to find.' "'I hoped so a while ago, but I've give it up. "'If them spalpeens knowed of any other way, "'what do they mean by fooling around that place up there, "'where they're likely to get shot if they show themselves, "'and they're likely to lose the best blankets they've got?' "'Fred did not feel competent to answer this question, "'and so he was forced to believe that Mickey was right in his conclusion "'that there was no other way of entering the cave than by the skylight above. "'Which is the same being the case, I propose that we try and see "'how the new blanket answers for a bid. "'But gara, but it's fine, as me mother used to say, "'when she run her hands over the head of me dad "'and felt the lumps made by the shillelagh. And having spread the blanket out in the darkness, he rubbed his hands over its velvety surface, admiring its wonderful texture. The texture is such that water can be carried in these Apache blankets with as much certainty as in a metal vessel. But Fred protested against both lying down to sleep at the same time. He thought it likely that the Apaches meant to visit the cave during the night, but his friend laughed his fears to scorn, assuring him that there would be no danger at all. In view of the reception tendered the blanket, the Apaches would take it for granted that the parties beneath were too vigilant to permit anyone to steal a march upon them. Mickey at once attested his sincerity by stretching out upon the inviting couch, and Fred concluded at last to join him. It was not long before the Irishman was sound asleep, but the lad lay awake a long time, looking reflectively up at the spot where he knew the opening to be, the opening which had been the means of letting himself and comrade down into that dismal retreat of solitude, and wondering what their enemies were doing. "'They must know that I am here. Lone Wolf will punish them if they don't keep me, so I'm sure they will do all they can to catch me again. I wish I was certain that there was no way of getting in but through that up there, and then I could sleep too, but I feel too scared to do it now.' This anxiety kept him awake a long time after Mickey became unconscious. But as hour after hour passed, and the stillness remained unbroken, his fears were gradually dissipated, and a feeling of drowsiness began stealing over him. Before consciousness entirely departed, he turned upon his side, that being the posture he generally assumed when asleep. 
As he made the movement, and his ear was placed against the blanket, which in its turn rested upon the ground, he heard something which aroused his suspicions instantly, and he raised his head. But when he rested on his hands with his shoulders thrown up, he could hear nothing at all. The earth was a better conductor of sound than the atmosphere, which accounted for what at first seemed curious. The boy applied his ear as before, and again he heard the noise, faintly but distinctly. As the eye was of no use, he pressed his head against the blanket and listened. Several minutes were occupied in this manner, and then he said in an undertone, "'I know what it is. It is somebody walking as softly as he can. There is another way of getting into this cavern, and those Apaches have found it out. They've got inside and are hunting for us.'" End of chapter 32 Read by Thomas Rose Chapter 33 of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 33 What the Footsteps Meant. Careful listening convinced Fred that there were two redskins groping around in the darkness. After making himself certain on that point, he reached his hand over and, grasping the muscular arm of Mickey O'Rooney, shook his companion quite vigorously. Fred was afraid that in waking the Irishman would utter some exclamation or make such a noise that he would betray their location. When therefore several shakings failed to arouse him, the boy easily persuaded himself that it was best to leave him where he was for a time. "'I can tell when they come too close,' he reflected, "'and then I will stir him up.' A few minutes later he found that he could hear the noise without placing his ear against the blanket, so he lay flat on his face resting the upper part of his body upon his elbows with his head thrown up. He peered off in the gloom in the direction whence the footsteps seemed to come, looking with that earnest piercing gaze as if he expected to see the forms of the dreaded Apaches become luminous and reveal themselves in the black night around. No ray of light relieved the Egyptian blackness. The campfire had been allowed to die out completely, and no red ember glowering like a demon's eye showed where it had been. The trained eye might have detected the faintest suspicion of light near the opening overhead, but it was faint indeed. "'They keep together,' added Fred to himself, as he distinguished the soft, stealthy tread over the ground. I should think they would separate, and they would be the more likely to find the place between them, but they want to be together when they run against Mickey, I guess. The shadowy footsteps were not regular. Occasionally they paused, and then they hurried on again, and then they settled down into the stealthiest kind of movement. The lad, it is true, had the newly found revolver with several of its chambers loaded at his command. There was some doubt, however, whether it could be relied upon owing to the probable length of time that had elapsed since the charges were placed there. As a precaution, Mickey O'Rooney had placed new caps upon the tubes, but had chosen to leave the charges themselves undisturbed. This beautiful weapon the lad held grasped in his hand, determined to blaze away at the prowling murderers the instant they should reveal themselves with sufficient distinctness to make his shot certain. An annoying delay followed. The Apaches seemed to know very nearly where the right spot was without being able to locate it definitely. The footsteps were heard first in one direction, and then they changed off to another. The warriors acted precisely as if they knew the location of their intended victims, but were seeking to find whether they were in the right position to be easily attacked. Thus matters remained for ten or fifteen minutes longer, during which the lad held himself on the alert, and was no little puzzled to comprehend the meaning for the course of their enemies. "'They daren't do anything now that they know where we are. They're afraid we're on the watch, and think if they wait a while longer we will drop off to sleep. But they will find—' A sudden light just then broke in upon young Munson. He was looking off in the direction of the sound— when the phosphorescent gleam of a pair of eyes shot out from the darkness upon him. There was a greenish glare in the unexpected appearance that left no doubt of their identity. 
Instead of Indians, as he had imagined at first, there was some kind of wild animal that was prowling about them. None of the Apaches had entered the cave at all, only a single beast. But where had he come from? By what means had he entered the cave? These were very significant questions of the greatest importance to the two who were shut within the subterranean prison. Fred did not feel himself competent to answer, so he reached over and shook Mickey harder than ever, determined that he should arouse. "'Come on, wake up, you sleepyhead," he called out. "'There might be a dozen bears come down on you and eat you up before you would open your eyes. Come, Mickey, there's need of your waking.' "'Begorra, but there's more need of me sleeping,' muttered the Irishman, gradually recalling his senses. "'I was in the midst of a beautiful dream in which there came two lovely females that looked like Bridget O'Flaherty and Molly McFizzle. Both were smiling in their winsome way on me, and both were advancing to give me a sweet kiss, not a crack over the head, I don't know which, when just before they reached me, you sticks out your paw and gives me a big shake. Ah, you spalpeen, why did you do that? Didn't you hear me say there was something in the cavern? I thought there were a couple of Apaches at first, but I guess it's a wild animal. The Irishman was all attention on the instant, and he started bolt upright. Whoosh! What's that you're seeing? Will you please say it over again? The lad hurriedly told him that an animal of some kind was lurking near them. Mickey caught up his rifle and demanded to know where he was. In such darkness as enveloped them it was necessary that the eyes of the beast should be at a certain angle in order to become visible to the two watchers. Both heard his light footsteps and knew where the eyes were likely to be discerned. "'There he is!' exclaimed Fred, as he caught sight of the green phosphorescent glitter of the two orbs, which is peculiar to the eyes of the feline species. Mickey detected them at the same moment and drew his rifle to his shoulder. He kept the kneeling position, fearing that the target would vanish if he should wait until he could rise. It is no easy thing for a hunter to take aim when he is utterly unable to detect the slightest portion of his weapon, and it was this fact which caused Mickey to delay his firing. However, before he could make his aim any way satisfactory, a bright thought struck him, and he lowered his gun, carefully letting the hammer down upon the tube. "'Ain't you going to fire?' asked the lad, who could not understand the delay. "'Whoosht, now! Would you have me slay me best friend?' "'I don't understand you, Mickey. Suppose I'd shot the beast, whatever he is. That would be the end of him. But leave him alone, and he'll show us the way out. How can he do that?' "'Don't you observe,' said the man, who had got the theory all perfectly arranged in his mind, "'that that creature couldn't get into this cave without coming in some way.' There was no gain saying such logic as that, but Fred knew that his friend meant more than he said. "'Of course he couldn't get in here without having some way of doing it. But suppose he took the same means as we did. How is that going to help us?' But the Irishman was certain that such could not be the case. "'There ain't any wild beasts as big fools as we was. "'You couldn't get em to walk into such a hole any more "'than you could get an Irishman to gaze calmly upon a hid without hitting it. "'You can make up your mind that there's some way leading into this cavern "'which nobody knows anything about excepting this wild creature, "'and if we let him alone, he'll go out again, showing us the path. "'I should think if he knew the route, some of the Indians would learn it. So anybody would think, but the creature has not given him the chance, so how can they learn it? If we play our cards right, me laddie, we're sure to win. What kind of an animal is it? They were all the time gazing at the point where the eyes were last seen, but the beast was continually shifting its position so that the orbs were no longer visible. The faint tipping of his feet upon the gravelly earth was heard, and now and then the transient flash of his eyes as he whisked back and forth was caught, but all vanished again almost as soon as seen. All that could be learned was that whatever the species of the animal, he owned large eyes, and they were placed close together. Neither of the two were sufficiently acquainted with the peculiarities of the different animals of the West to identify them by any slight peculiarities. 
I don't think he can be an elephant or a rhinoceros, said Mickey reflectively, because such creatures don't grow in these parts. What about his being a grizzly bear? He can't be that, said Fred, who had been given time to note the special character of the footsteps before he awoke his companion. He walks too lightly. What do you conclude him to be? If there were such things as wild dogs, I would be sure he was one. Then I have it. He must be a wolf. I guess you're right. He acts just like one, trotting here and there while his eyes shine like we used to see them when we were camped on the prairie and they used to hang around the camp waiting for a chance to get something to eat. It's easy to double him up, said Mickey, who had just caught a glimpse of the eyes again. But if he show the way out of here, I'll make a vow never to shoot another wolf, even if he tries to chaw me head off. How are we going to discover the place? Just follow him. He'll hang round a while, very likely all night, and when he finds out there's nothing to make here, he'll trot off again. All we've got to do is do the same, and he'll show us the way out. It don't look so easy to me, said Fred a few minutes later, when he had been busily turning the scheme over in his mind. If we only had the daylight to see him, it wouldn't be so hard. But here he is right close to us, and it is only now and then that we can tell where he is. Ye's are right, for it isn't likely that we can walk straight out by the way that he does, but we can learn from his movements pretty nearly where the place is, and then we can take a torch and hunt for a day or two, and I don't see how we can miss it. There seemed to be reason in this, although the lad could not feel as sanguine as did his companion. The wolf, as he believed it to be, was doubtless familiar with every turn of the cave, and when he was ready to go was likely to vanish in a twinkling, scurrying away with such a speed that would defy pursuit. However, there was a promise or a possibility, at least, of success, and that certainly was something to be cheerful over, even though the prospect was not brilliant, and Fred was resolved that failure should not come through remissness of his. The continuation of this absorbing story is entitled The Cave in the Mountain. End of In the Pecos Country by Edward Ellis. Read by Thomas Rose.